Professor Swantes uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Asan Bai and uh, Salia Behan is going to join us in the course of the conversation and all friends who are present. So as Professor Saltes is uh, interested in both Christianity and Islam, and what a, a deeply moving uh, connection them with Al-Fitr. And in fact, it is uh, Al-Fitr connects directly to the, the teachings and the legacy of Lord Jesus Christ. So I would share this screen for a few minutes from there, if you permit me. Uh, yes, you can see. So, in fact, uh, I build upon this from an internet resource on this subject. The word Idul Fitr is comprised of two separate words, Eid and Fitr. The word Eid means something which returns over and over. And she refers to the kind of happiness which comes again and again. This word is only used in one instance in the Holy Quran in reference to the disciples of Prophet of Jesus. The Holy Quran mentions in Surah Al Maida chapter 5, verse 115. And said Jesus, son of man, Mary, O Allah, our Lord, send down to us a table from heaven spread with food that it may be to us a festival eat to the first of us and to the last of us. And a sign from thee and provide sustenance for us, for thou art the best of sustenance. So even if then the, uh, the thought goes that uh, however a closer study of the Holy Quran reveals that Allah mentions not a day but a raj of happiness in reference to the Muslims after mentioning the importance of sacrifice. The Holy Quran states, surely Allah has purchased of the believers their persons and their property in return for the garden they shall have. For example, this surah points in many directions. For example, uh, sacrifice and also that the limits of both personhood and property and the theme of the garden. Then in one of the sermons, the Holy Prophet emphasized that one should stay away from innovations in Islam. He also mentioned in one of his Eid sermons that al -Sar, the day of resurrection and I are together like these two fingers of mine. Again, this points to many deeper invitations like the day of resurrection and myself. The moment and eternity, they are co-present. And uh, then we come to this thought. The Holy Prophet told them that Allah had in fact given them two even better days of festival, Idul Fitr and Idul Adha. The Holy Prophet Muhammad allowed and encouraged Idul Fitr to be a day of the remembrance of Allah Almighty, as well as a day of general happiness and festivity. Hajrati Asa narrates that once on the day of Eid, the Holy Prophet came into the house and two girls were singing songs and playing a simple instrument. The Holy Prophet came and lay down on bed and didn't say anything. Hazrat Abu Bakr then came into the house and became angry and asked the girls to stop singing. The Holy Prophet stopped Hazrat Abu Bakr and asked the girls to continue singing. And then the philosophy of Idul Fitr is not to celebrate the end of fasting but rather to continue on one's spiritual journey. There are two main messages inscribed in the month of Ramadan, namely verses of Allah and realization of the pains and sorrows of other human beings. Idul Fitr is the continuation of both these messages. It is a day of celebration, where in addition to the five obligatory prayers, the believers also gather for a sixth congregational prayer to remember Allah. So therefore, what is deeply significant is that Idul Fitr is an occasion 
which is a direct reference to, uh, to Christianity. So therefore, it is a practice of a living border crossing. And secondly, the whole thing of happiness in a cross-cultural and a cross-religious way, how this idea of both sacrifice and joy, and this is a thought that uh, Professor Soltes can help us understand more, how we can understand it in conjunction with vision and practices like yajna, for example. Yajna is simultaneously a space and time of sacrifice as well as a time of joy. And uh, on the theme of sacrifice, quickly I want to present a poem which can uh, possibly you know, invite us to think of sacrifice and renunciation together. You said sacrifice is the foundation of life, but is not sacrifice linked to violence? Sacrifice and love and sacrifice and Christ. Christ, the yogi of love, becomes a justification for sacrificing millions in the name of sacrifice. We sacrifice women, children, and each other. Religion of love becomes a religion of sacrifice. Sacrifice, gift of virgins, exchange of women, is the sacrifice or renunciation. Renunciation is different. A path of love and communication. Let the violence of sacrifice be transformed with the sadhana of practical renunciation. A new art of co-responsibility, exchange of gifts, exchange of selves, an economy of gift, a politics of renunciation, a spirituality of transformation. Finally, I am thinking about the nature of language that gets involved in Idul Fitr. As we can realize it is a border crossing language of both Islam and Christianity. But also in terms of in this space, how one is speaking with each other and the divine in the context of nature. Here I'm reminded of the whole world Upanishad. And this afternoon, I was reading a very deep meditation on Upanishad by my friend, Professor Devasis Banerjee, who teaches in California Institute of Integral Studies. He presents two aspects of language that is at work in such connections of togetherness. One is language as intimate speech, and secondly, language as intuitive speech. So probably in conditions like Idul Fitr, when we are coming together with joy, but the work of language is an intimate speech, that intimacy with each other, intimacy with the divine, and that intimacy is really generating an intuitive learning, an intuitive understanding of each other as well as the divine. So with this submission, now looking forward to Professor Sante's presentation and rather later Samia. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so very much, Anantaji, as always. Profound insights and interesting comments coming from you. And um, I'm happy to add what I can. Let me uh, begin with uh, a couple of general comments before becoming more specific. The first general comment, the word religion itself, a reminder that, and I'm speaking obviously of English, so this applies to English and you have different terms that we translate into English as religion from different languages that don't necessarily have the same precise connotation. But for our purposes, it is the connotation in English that is important because the English word is a direct der derivative of Latin. And in Latin, L vowel G is a binding. R E means back or again. So religio, religion is that which binds us back or binds us again to the source that we humans believe has made us. However, we particularly conceive of that source, whether we think of it as a single divinity or a triune God or an endless array of divinities, whatever the particulars are, we humans seem to have in common with each other. So I request uh, Marupai. Uh, Marupai is a philosopher and uh, well known for our uh, Swadesha Chakra family. Okay, if Maru, 
Marubai is taking some time. We can invite. Uh... Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sally had requested me somehow that she was busy with the guest trip. So, in fact, it was a pleasure to join you on this e day. I was listening to a wonderful this presentation. Eye opening. I just recall Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great philosopher of Judaism, who interprets the whole religion, in fact, as celebration. So Eid is fundamentally a fundamentally the spirit of celebration that Islam in its own way imbues life with. Now do you, if we see in Islamic tradition, we see every good occasion or whenever a saint passes or is coming in the birth or there we celebrate his day. So these are some, these are celebrations. In fact, even death of a saint is celebrated as an event with a feast and all that. So deep down religion, it's in fact itself is a feast. So when we see Eid in our this community, the way it is celebrated, say for example, sacrifice of animals and the food is given to the poor. If this is arranged more nicely than it is currently, if we can say it is a one month grand celebration. It's a free lunch for all from Muslim common from Muslims who, are, who can afford to have a who can afford to sacrifice. In fact, every Muslim who has around forty five thousand saving, he has to sacrifice a sheep or a or any other animal. There are various categories. And this meat has to be distributed, ideally. By this account, for in fact, in all Muslim families, you will say for two to three weeks, it's a grand celebration. We invite friends, we invite relatives, we host parties, and uh, there is so much meat to be distributed, to be cooked, and then, so from a simple point of view, so you know that the food as the importance of food in traditional religion, I think we have generally forgotten it. The food as sacrament. Oh, the whole idea of this is embodied in the in the way Qurbani is done. So my point is, where else in the in the world we would find the whole community offering everyone free lunch, free dinner, and a very sumptuous one. For a whole month, and if we are able to collect the proper this kurbani meat and then distribute it to the poorest of the poor in the world and store it for quite pretty long time through deep freezers, we can extend, I think, it to the whole year. So there will be no protein nutrition, this protein deficiency in the population. This is one aspect. But another aspect is. Here we celebrate by prayer as well. So in fact, prayer itself is a sort of celebration of our union with divinity. What is prayer? It is escape from mechanism to freedom. And in E, there is, we keep re rehearsing some certain particular words, labbaika, labbaika, allahumma labbaika, and all those which are done in Mecca and then some takbirat. In fact, we celebrate God's glory is celebrated. Now, what is God's glory? God's glory is ultimately glory of life, sacrality of life. So deep down, it is about taking life as a feast, celebrating, celebrating, because deep down world is ananda. It is a effulgence of the divine joy. So from that point of view, a Muslim culture is fundamentally a culture of joy. Every occasion it ties, it has in a way framed in such a way that it becomes an occasion of joy. The sorrow of death is transformed into a song of joy the, through the collective feast, because when, an, when anyone dies, the collective feast is served for days. And then sometimes it's 
fourth day, sometimes on forty day, sometimes on fifteen day, sometimes on animal day. And saints Urs, saints death anniversaries or particular moments of their self-realization, they are also celebrated. And in fact, whenever a child is born, it is celebrated with a feast. We have to sacrifice a sheep at that time as well. So the whole life is in fact a rhythm of celebration. So the message of Eid is caring for the poorer, for the needy, for the other, providing him the key, food. I, I'm sure if we're able to manage properly this food, we're, we're able to create food, uh, free lunch, free dinner for the poor and ready for the whole year. And in fact, in the, in the most distant areas of the world, it is being taken there from Saudi Arabia and other places. So that's why uh -huh, not only these dogs celebrate because they get so much waffles and all those things, but everyone on earth it's a great joy of celebration, but then what, then what is to be distinctly noticed these three days, we must visit relatives, we must visit funds, we must distribute meat to them. So it's an occasion when people have to meet, they necessarily meet. So if there are any skirmishes, any problems, any problems with relationships, they are healed on Eid days. That in that sense, Eid is also a, Eid is a celebration as well of love of fellow feeling of this and eid you mean literally the khushi so the idea of having religion as what we call ecstasy and then trying to give it a particular embodiment that a, that a whole culture can do i think eid like things festivities celebrations they are and we decorate houses or at least we the children, new, clo new clothes are bought, and it's a huge market around these things. There are so many people whose only income is get generated on the days of Eid. Then for the year, they do not need to do anything. So this is another way of how Eid brings life and khushi, joy to so many people. So from an economic point of view, from a spiritual point of view, from a more aesthetic point of view, Eid is joy, joy, and joy. It's a holy of, we can say, not only colors, but all kinds of beauty that Islamic culture can bring, from the beauty of food to the beauty of relationship. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mahir uh, Now I request uh, Arif Rashid Bhai. And uh, he's taking some time. I request Bajaj uh, here. Uh, hello, just one minute here, Randi. So we have Hassan Jafri Bhai, and Minati had kindly invited uh, him. Yes to offer some thought as a discussion. So let us begin with Asan Jafriji, please. Sure. Asan bhai. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. And I assalamu. wish you Eid Mubarak to all of you. Uh, my name is Asan Jafri and I am jo I've joined from Karnataka, Bangalore. I belong to Sunni uh, school and then Hanafi what Professor Soltis mentioned. Uh, I'm related to the Sufism school, Chishtiya order of Sufism, Khankhai Niazia, which is situated in Bareilly, Uttar Pradesh in India. So I just want to give you a glimpse of the East celebration that is happening at my home. Some people you would like to see live in action before I share my thoughts. Are you able to see? So there are a couple of people here, I guess, in the background. Eid Mubarak. Your background is blurred. Your background is blurred, Sanji. Ah, oh, okay. Just give me a second. It's okay if it's blurred. 
<laughs> I've learned it from just, others. We'll just describe it to our old age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there are a couple of kids and everybody's having a feast and see. enjoyment. It's yeah. Beautiful. There are some ladies behind the partition. So it's live in action. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So as uh, Professor Saltes and Maru Bhai. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you now. I guess he keeps cutting in and out though, huh? Sorry, I lost you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Now we hear you. Oh, okay, cool. <clears throat> So as Professor Saltes mentioned, Maru Bhai mentions, uh, main concern of the objective of everything we do on the Eid is to share, share with others uh, who are not, who are needy, who are not as sufficient as we are. In Eid al-Fitr, uh, we have the month of fasting, right? So during that month, we offer iftar, we call people, invite people and share the food with them. Uh, even before offering the prayers on Eid al-Fitr, we have to take out what is called as fitra. And that is how Eid al-Fitr comes out, right? So we share the money so that others can also, or food, so that they can also participate in the festivities. Eid al-Adha, we share the meat of the sacrificial goat or the animal with others who are needy. Uh, on any of the occasion, like he also, Maru Bhai also mentioned, in Sufism, when we uh, any saint or a friend of God passes away, the celebrations are called as urs. Urs literally means a wedding. So he, uh, the, the saint has the desire to join his beloved in his life. And the day he passes from this realm to the other is celebrated that he got the desire of his life, what he wanted, and uh, that is how it's celebrated. Urs. So the basic concept is to share. Share when you are happy, share with something, uh, someone, uh, is born into your family, share when somebody passes away, share when you are ill, share, give out sadhka when you are ill. So at every opportunity you have to share, whether you are happy or you are sad or you are sick, the intent is to share with others. And that is the whole idea of everything we do. There are a couple of things that uh, we can, uh, learn from this festival of Eid al-Adha. In my mind, there are seven main aspects. Well, the first one is obedience to Allah. Second one is what's the lessons of the sacrifice. Third is trust and faith. The fourth is gratitude and remembrance. The fifth is selflessness and generosity. Sixth is atonement and spiritual cleansing. And the last is unity and brotherhood. So just to uh, briefly elaborate on uh, each of these points. So basically the story of Prophet Ibrahim, his willingness to sacrifice his beloved son, Ismail, as we believe, Professor Saltis pointed out, the majority of Muslims believe it was uh, Prophet Ismail. As commanded by Allah, this exemplifies the importance of complete submission and obedience to God's will. So it serves as a reminder for Muslims to prioritize their faith and trust in above, above Allah. Uh, in Allah above all else. On the lessons of sacrifice, so it's sacrificing an animal is also basically signifying that you have to sacrifice your anger, you have to sacrifice your love for the world, you have to sacrifice all the earthly desires. So that is just one part where we sacrifice an animal, but embodies certain other things as well. So we have to learn to sacrifice our own desires, ego, material positions for the sake of pleasing Allah and benefiting others. On trust and faith, Prophet Ibrahim's uh, unwavering trust in Allah's plan and his willingness to offer his son as a sacrifice displays the depth of his faith. So he got the vision in a dream that Allah wanted him to sacrifice his most beloved thing. And it happened in a series of nights. In the first night, when he saw the dream, he sacrificed a lot of animals. And the second night, again, he saw the dream and then he sacrificed more animals. But eventually he realized that Allah wanted, to, uh, wanted me to sacrifice my most beloved thing, which is my son. And that is how he, he took Prophet Ismail 
to sacrifice him and then we all know that uh, God replaced him with the ram. But and it was during that period where Satan basically came in and tried to say, what kind of God is this who asks your son for a sacrifice? And that is what we do during the Hajj, that we throw stones at him, at the pillars that signify, that signifies uh, Satan whispering and asking us not to do what is we are enjoined to do. So that is trust and faith was one of the major aspects that we want to remember through the other. On the gratitude and remembrance, so this act of sacrifice is gesture of gratitude to Allah for his countless blessings and provisions. So we Muslims express their gratitude by sacrificing an animal and sharing the meat with family, friends, and the less fortunate. So this actually uh, you know, reminds us to appreciate the provisions that we have received and to be mindful of the needs of others. On selflessness and generosity, it again reflects the values of selflessness and generosity. We are encouraged to share the meat with those in need, fostering a sense of compassion, empathy, and solidarity within the community. This act reminds individual to prioritize the well-being and welfare of others, especially those who are less fortunate. On the atonement and spiritual cleansing, the act of sacrifice is also seen as a means of seeking forgiveness and spiritual purification. By sacrificing an animal, Muslims acknowledge their own shortcomings and sins, seeking Allah's forgiveness and striving for a renewed sense of purity and righteousness. Lastly, unity and brotherhood. So Eid al-Adha or Eid al-Fitr or any other Eid, it promotes unity and brotherhood among Muslims. The act of sacrifice is performed collectively and the meat is shared with family, friends and the wider community. This practice strengthens bonds, encourages social cohesions, and reminds individuals of the shared responsibilities towards one another. Just one last comment. So as Muslims believe after Prophet Muhammad, there's no other prophet who's going to come. So in Sufis, this vilayat started through Hazrat Ali, who was a son-in-law, as well as the cousin of Prophet Muhammad, and through him, the spiritual schools of thought in Sufism started. One of the major saints, Khaja Muinuddin Chishti, the founder of Chishti Asilsila in Ajmer, Rajasthan, he said, be like a river. A river doesn't distinguish in quenching the thirst of anyone who comes to it. So the purpose of river is to quench the thirst. It doesn't distinguish, it doesn't pass any judgment. Be like a sun who provides warmth and energy to everyone on the world. Be like the earth, which is hospitable to everyone. That is the main concept of Sufism from a school of thought which I, I belong to. And all the ease and all the practices in Islam are kind of related to making, sharing it with others, sharing it with the less fortunate be it in form of fast or fees or animal or sadhaka or zakat, which is a 2.5% tax on your income in an annual year based on certain condition. So the whole purpose is to share it with others. With this, I would like to close and I would like to thank uh, Minitiji for inviting me to this uh, program. And it was lovely hearing Professor Salta so far and uh, Maru Bhai as well. Thank you so much. Eid Mubarak once again. Thank you, Hassan Jafri. Now we'll uh, take uh, five to eight minutes to uh, listen some of uh, the reflections from our distinguished uh, participants. I request Khwaja uh, Jia to share some of his reflections. It's taking some time. I request uh, Professor Gyan to look. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was really very interesting. And uh, well, it is difficult to 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 express um, a farther farther ideas because it was so 
rich and suggestions and then ref and on reflections and so on and observation i i i signed some points but really i do not know whether they are appropriate for the discussion uh, well something uh, while hearing something uh, let me think to at the at the question in which uh, uh, in which uh, uh, there is, so to speak, a plurality, immediately a plurality of uh, of tradition and a way of uh, making a fest or um, a festivity, uh, even though there is a common root. And uh, well, as association of ideas came to me, to my mind, a point of, uh, I, am, I am not sure in this moment, I, I, I was thinking when I have read it, this because I have read this, which uh, I think is, a, is it is in the Pirkei Avot, but I am not sure. And I think there is there a discussion about the first, the, 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 the that is, it is so uh, in the form of a myth, uh, a legend, uh, there is, uh, imagine that there, there is a contest, a competition between the letters of the alphabet uh, about which letter should be the first letter in which God writes the Torah. And there is a competition between the, <laughs> this very beautiful as image, this competition of the letters. And at the end, uh, who wins? Uh, bet wins. Bet and the first word, if I'm not mistaken, is Bereshit. And the interesting thing is why Bet wins. Bet wins, uh, it is explained in the tradition of uh, the rabbinic explanation. Because first of all, Bet, uh, as it is made, express the division between the diving and the human. But on the other hand, and there is perhaps a more important point of it, bet is two. This means that we are divided, which does not mean that we cannot find a common point, but that we have to be plural. That is that the way in which we honor God is also a way in of plurality of natural plurality so that is we have to have a plurality of interpretations of ideas of ways of celebration which does not mean that there, there are no intersections that is there are intersections in a plurality in a diversity intersections in diversity and this diversity is so to speak rooted in the way in which uh, uh, god proposes and writes the torah and I found this image also is very, very significant. In my opinion, it is very beautiful as image. The first time I, I, I read it, I, I remember really, I gasped when, when I read it because I, 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 I could not imagine a competition between letters, first of all. And then all these explanation of why better, why better shit, and so on and so forth. And the second point perhaps is, uh, there are important suggestions, in my opinion, in the contemporary interpretation uh, of uh, the of uh, of uh, of the unity and diversity between religions and between ways of honoring God. Uh, in, uh, for instance, the late um, Rabbi, uh, chief Rabbi of 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 the United Kingdom, Jonathan Sachs, wrote a book, for instance, how we can avoid the clash of civilization, and said. The clash of civilization should not, uh, could not be avoided while becoming all equal, all identical in our tradition. That is, we, can, we make a tradition which is equal for everybody. We are uniform. No, not at all. This is the, the wrong way. We have to remain plural. We have to remain plural because this uh, uniformity, this first uniformity is uniformity would bring us to more conflicts that is would bring about the opposite we, which we want we we, we we cannot believe that 
to a uniformity, an imposed uniformity that corresponds then equality, concord between men. The opposite is the truth. This is also in, in, in my opinion, a, a, an important point to reflect on when we reflect about the connection and the relationship between different religions and traditions. And then uh, the third point which came to my mind was another interpretation of uh, the Torah, of the, of the Babel Tower. And this is also, in my opinion, not so uh, is significant because there is an interpretation which says why the Tower of Babel cannot function because it is the arrogance of the humans who want to uniform, to make uniform what God does not want that, that it is uniform. God does not want that we are all equals, that we have, have only one tradition, one religion, one principle, one way of thinking. No, this would be the Tower of Babel. That is the absolute uniformity and the annulation of every diversity. But this is not the plan of God. God wants that we are different, not separated, not isolated between each other, but yes, different with different traditions, which does not mean that we, can, we cannot have intersection within each other. The, on the other hand, intersection presupposes that we are different and that we live together in the richness of these differences. This is what, what I wanted to say. I do not know whether... I, it is appropriate to the festivity, but anyway, I thank you very much because, because it was very brilliant and I thank you really very, very much. Thank you. And Gianluigi, I do think it's relevant because the fact of the matter is uh, you have uh, an infinite number of particular ways in which Eid is, is celebrated across the world. You have an infinite number of, of particularities of customs just within the Muslim world alone as far as Hajj is concerned, as far as exactly how Ramadan is handled. So uh, to say nothing of obviously beyond the bounds of Islam to the rest of the world as well. So actually, I think uh, th this idea is particularly, particularly appropriate. I always find it odd, by the way, that, you know, everyone agrees, okay, God made the whole universe. There are no two leaves that are alike. There are no two trees that are alike. There are no two snowflakes that are like. There are no two humans who are like. And yet there are people who think, but there's only one correct path to God. Oh, it's my path, by the way, you know? So it's an odd kind of contradiction. So thank you by, for that, for that, uh, for those comments. And after the yeah, hello, yes. am I already? Yeah, thank you. Yes. First, I would like to thank Professor Ari Saltos. As always, his presentation was deep, insightful, and enlightening. I, I mean, it opened, it was eye opener for me. Um, but I found so many uh, similarities between all the many religions, like he was describing the five pillars of uh, faith, like belief, prayers, charity, fasting, and pilgrimage. It is there in base of many. It, like Hindu, Christianity, Sikhism, many religion. Then, uh, yes, I had a little bit of doubt about that small and, and big game. I think right now there is no time to uh, discuss about it. Uh, just, uh, I'd like to just ask two things. It may be a little bit, uh, he was talking about the subsets in Muslim. So whether they're also subjected to discrimination like that in other religion, in Hinduism, exam, for example, it is there. So whether it is there. And one more question. Do you think that some religious rules should be changed to suit our current uh, scenario or current needs? So, thank you. Well, I think as a, as a historical truth, every religious tradition over the course of time and as it spreads across space makes little sorts of changes so that it remains relevant to changed conditions. But I would say core values don't. That's what remains in place. But of course, the core values tend to be shared across religious traditions anyway. But the details 
are constantly undergoing slight shifts and changes. So I think that's perfectly legitimate because we wouldn't be us as a species if that didn't happen. The problem is not that I believe differently from you or I worship or celebrate differently from you. The problem is when I begin to think that my version of how to worship and how to celebrate is the only valid version for you and me, for all of us, because that's my ego speaking, that's not God speaking. Recognizing the legitimacy of difference, which is what Gianluigi was pointing out as God's own will, that you know what the way I do it is absolutely 150% the most perfect in the world for me. There's no contradiction between that and, and your way, which is different, is 150% the most correct way in the world for you. Because ultimately, we are dealing with the reality that we access by belief and not by rational proof. God, we believe in. We can't prove God. Just as <laughs> I had a long conversation with a, with a very dyed-in-the-wool atheist, you, you may know of him, Christopher Hitchens, a number of years back when he was still alive, and he went on for 15 minutes nonstop about all the problems of the world, and it's all because of religion. I said, Christopher, you sound like a fundamentalist. And he walked away because he was, because he is so he was so certain that he knew that's just as fundamentalist as a knife wielding fundamentalist practitioner of whatever religious faith who kills others in the name of God believes I know how it's supposed to be. That's the problem when I, I confuse the the legitimacy of interpretive variation with revelation itself and start to mistake my understanding for the only viable, only correct understanding. So yeah, changes all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I, Minati Pradhan, on behalf of Sodha Sajakra and Vision Idam Center for Asian Blossoming, would like to thank our today's chief, chief speaker, Professor Ori Saltas, as always, for his deep and insightful presentation. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I would like to thank today's discussant, Dr. Maruf Shah and Ehsan Jafriji for their uh, enlightening presence with us, because Ehsanji always I have met as a host, never as a speaker. So thank you, Ehsanji. With the short notice, you made it, uh, you could make it. So thank you so much for being present with us. I would also like to thank Professor Ganluji, uh, MD Chandar Sahab, and not to forget, uh, normally I don't thank uh, Anantabhai and Randir, but today I want to thank them because they have arranged this subject and uh, allowed us to learn in a new realm. So thank you all. I, I also would like to thank today's all the Zoom participants and our Facebook platform participants for being with us and learning with us. Thank you all. Please pardon me if I've forgotten anybody's name, but I really thank everyone from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.